Last week we started to look at the subject by faith alone and we're going to explore it a little further today. Uh, Romans chapter 4 verse 1 to 17 I'm reading from the New English translation. What then shall we say that Abraham our ancestor according to the flesh has discovered regarding this matter? For if Abraham was declared righteous by works he has something to boast about but not before god for what does the scripture say i want you to remember that little phrase that's the important thing what does the scripture say it's not so important what your experience was or is what does the scripture say everything must be judged in light of what the scripture says don't tell me about your dreams or your visions that's good for you but don't try to make it seem as if your dream and your vision is on the same level with the word of god don't tell me about um, your apparent gifting and your ecstatic experiences are all these things grounded in scripture what does the scripture say abraham believed god and it was credited to him as righteousness. I might say to us, brothers and sisters, that I do have a little concern that maybe some of us put more credence, more trust in our experiences than we do in what the scripture says. And we will contend more for our traditions and our experiences than we do than we would believe scripture now to abraham believed god paul says and it was credited to him as righteousness now to the one who works his pay is not credited due to grace but due to obligation but to the one who does not work but believes in the one who declares the ungodly righteous his faith is credited as righteousness so even david himself speaks regarding the blessedness of the man to whom god credits righteousness apart from works and david now quotes from the psalm blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will never count sin. Is this blessedness then for the circumcision or also for the uncircumcision? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited to him? Was he circumcised at the time or not? No, he was not circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So that he would become the father of all those who believe but have never been circumcised that they too could have righteousness credited to them we won't get to this verse today but maybe i could ask again as we did last week who is your father have you had a different experience than abraham you had a different saving experience from Abraham. If you did, if the Lord saved you, 
in a different way from the way he saved Abraham, then you are not saved. Because he is a father of us all as it relates to spiritual, spiritual uh, fatherhood. So if you have a salvation experience that is different from your father's salvation experience, if, if you were saved some other way, then that's, that's a very serious problem. I hope you see that, brothers and sisters. I, I hope you see that. What does the scripture say? Verse 12, and he is also the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham possessed when he was still uncircumcised. Whose footsteps are we walking in? For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not fulfilled through the law but through the righteousness that comes by faith for if they became heirs by the law faith is empty and the promise is nullified for the law brings wrath because where there is no law there is no transgression either. You see why pastors have to be careful what rules they set up in church? Because pastors can make transgressors out of the people. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. All right. You are very quiet. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Huh? You sure? All right. For this reason, it is my faith so that it may be by grace because if it's not by faith then it's not by grace with the result that the promise may be certain to all the descendants that the promise may be what certain that the promise may be certain to all the descendants not only to those who are under the law but also to those who have the faith of abraham who is the who is the father of us all as it is written i have made you the father of many nations he is our father in the presence of god whom he believed the god who makes the dead alive and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do lord we greatly need your help being so so foolish and so insufficient and so lacking in everything that would be profitable if you do not help us we will surely fail please come to our rescue we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Sunday we stated that in Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul explains justification by faith apart from works. That is very important, that little clause, apart from works. Using Abraham as his primary example of how God declares a sinner righteous why does God use Abraham as the primary example of how God declares a sinner righteous why does he use Abraham because he's the father of us all the question that Paul posed to his readers was as follows was the patriarch Abraham justified by faith alone? Or was he justified by some work of his own in addition to his faith? If the scriptural evidence clearly indicated that Abraham was justified by faith alone, then Paul 
Paul's doctrine of salvation would be vindicated and established. If, however, the scriptural evidence indicated that Abraham was justified by some work of his own in addition to his faith, then Paul's doctrine of salvation would be disproved and destroyed. So think about your own conversion, brothers and sisters. How were we saved? Were we saved by faith alone? I'm asking you and I'm asking myself to consider our own personal situation. Were we saved by faith alone? Or were we saved by some work of our own in addition to our faith? It is an extremely important question. Because how you were saved goes a far way in determining how you live your life as a Christian. It might not seem to occur to us uh, uh, just, just apparently, but it, it is so. Have we ever seriously thought about this, brothers and sisters? I ask it again as I did last week. Are we interested in what the Bible has to say about it? Or do we just want to remain comfortable in our own traditional opinion? If we are convinced, hear me now. Just listen to me for a little while. If we are convinced that we are saved by faith alone, it is likely that we will be inclined to walk by faith or to live by faith because that's how we were saved. If we are convinced that we were saved by our works in addition to faith, we will be inclined to walk by sight. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul writes, For we walk by faith, not by sight. But if you were not saved by faith alone, it is going to be difficult to you to walk by faith. Because how you started is how you're going to be persuaded you should continue. You see what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? Faith does not focus on natural circumstances or on emotion. It does not even focus on experience because we can have different experiences. Faith focuses on the word of God and that only. Let me say it again. Faith focuses on the word of God and that only. Faith doesn't focus on uh, what is happening around me or on how I feel at the present time or what my experience has been because God could have delivered me out of danger five years ago but this time I'm not going to be delivered I'm going to have to die you, are, you, are you understanding me brethren? God might have brought you this way last year and he might have delivered you from every kind of suffering, but he might allow for this time for you to go through severe suffering. And you can't say that 
oh because he didn't bring me out this time like last time he doesn't love me or there must be something wrong with my life that's not how faith operates we walk by faith not by sight those who walk by sight walk alone when we walk by sight we are saying in effect i believe in myself i trust myself i am depending on myself i know what i have experienced when we walk by faith what we are saying in effect is i believe god i trust god i am depending on god let me push this a little further if you don't mind it's hard for you because even if you mind i'm still going to push it through eh? because i'm up here i'm sorry because of the way many of us were indoctrinated we are persuaded that the Christian life is always supposed to be a great, overwhelming experience. We blast off like a rocket going to the moon, and we hurtle through space at 25,000 miles per hour until we reach our destination, heaven, where we will put on our golden slippers walk on streets of gold and live in mansions with no rent to pay but we do not live the christian life in a spacecraft we live the christian life in our homes at school at our workplaces in a fallen broken world that is ever ripening unto the judgment of God let us not delude ourselves brothers and sisters things are not going to get better they are going to get worse the only way to live in a world like this is to walk by faith how do we walk by faith we walk by faith by believing and obeying the word of God. We walk by faith by believing and obeying the word of God in spite of what we see, in spite of how we may feel, in spite of what we are presently experiencing walking by faith means committing ourselves to the lord and relying entirely on him to meet our needs living by faith builds christian character living by faith witnesses to a lost world and living by faith glorifies god but if we were saved if we think we were saved by our own works in addition to faith then we are always going to be tempted to think that our standing before god depends on our works if we appreciate that we were saved by faith alone then we are going to trust god that the righteousness of jesus christ in which we are clothed will be enough for us to stand before him uncondemned and no work that we can do can ever make him love us more and no sin that we can commit will ever make him hate us more how were we saved in verse 2 paul writes for if abraham was declared righteous by works he has something to boast about but not before god so in this verse paul argues that if abraham had been justified or declared righteous or saved means the same thing 
You can't be justified without being declared righteous because justification means that you have been declared righteous. You can't be declared righteous without being saved. So if Abraham had been saved by virtue of his works, he would indeed have something to boast of. But the record of scripture clearly indicates that there was not even one work, not even one work of his own of which Abraham could boast before God. For in verse 3, God himself testifies that Abraham was justified or declared righteous by simply believing God. That is God's testimony and God must know. Brethren, if you want to find out how a person is saved, shouldn't you want to hear what God has to say? God, God no must know how he save us. Whose report will you believe? I know which report I believe. God testifies that Abraham believed God and, and, and it, his belief or his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and his belief in God, his faith in God, that alone was enough, that was sufficient for God to credit righteousness to him. This is what the scripture prescribes. Abraham believed God. We said this last week. That is all he did. That was all he had to do. And brothers and sisters, that is all we have to do. Because we cannot be justified or declared righteous or saved in a way different to Abraham. That is all any person who ever was saved, is saved, or will be saved will have ever have to do. That is the prescription of scripture. That is what the scripture says. I know you may have had your experience, but don't force your experience into the Bible. You might have had a, a very glorious salvation experience. Or you might have thought that you had. Because your experience is not tantamount to the scripture. I'm not going to push it too far today. Hopefully not. It was Abraham's belief or his faith in God which was credited or reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified or declared Righteous by faith alone, and so were we if we are really saved. You see why I said the question is important, brethren? This is a very important question. Paul appeals to the Old Testament. What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? Paul appeals to the Old Testament as a witness testifying that justification has always been by faith alone and has never been by works. He quotes from Genesis 15 6. That's what he quotes from. What does the scripture say? Hear me brothers and sisters. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to say. What does scripture say? In other words, what does scripture prescribe? What does scripture prescribe? The important
important thing is not so much what scripture describes but what scripture prescribes I am afraid that in many instances we have taken descriptions of something that occurred and have turned them into prescriptions for the church and I'm going to show you how dangerous that can be by using my imagination a little to describe is to give an account of what happened that's a description to give an account of what happened to prescribe is to lay down authoritatively as a guide or a direction or a rule of action It is extremely dangerous. Hear me, my precious brethren. It is extremely dangerous to make a doctrine based on what we see described in Scripture. Our doctrinal positions must be grounded in what Scripture prescribes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's look at a scripture here. This morning, while I was just thinking through this, this came to me. It's not even in my notes. I want us to look at three cases. The first one is found in Mark chapter 8. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. But you could follow in whatever Bible you have. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus. What kind of man? A blind man. And people... And they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes. How would you like for me to do that to you? You wouldn't mind too much if you were blind and I did that and you could see. But if I spat in your face and you were blind and after I spat in your face you still couldn't see anyway Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village then spitting on the man's eyes he laid his hands on him and asked can you see anything now the man looked around yes he said I see people but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. You see that? So at the end of the process, was the man able to see? Yes. Okay, let's go to Let's go to uh, let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter ten. Let's go to Mark chapter ten. We encounter another blind man. That first man was from Bethsaida, but let's look at Mark chapter ten, verse forty-six. Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd follow, followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, 
Son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. But he shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Was the man able to see in the end? Did he have the same experience like the man in Bethsaida? No spitting didn't take place. I see, I see, I see. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. I, we must work quickly out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground. Jesus had a powerful spitting ministry. Made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Did this man end up seeing eventually? Was his experience like the other two? No. But they all had the same result. Eh? I see. Do you understand where I'm going? Or do I need to push it a little more? Push it a little more? Let's look at Proverbs 17 verse 8 from the New English Translation. Proverbs 17, verse 8. I read that this morning. Early this morning, I read this. From the New English Translation. Proverbs 17, 8. A bribe works like a charm for the one who offers it. In whatever he does, he succeeds. A bribe. Is a bribe a good thing? Huh? Is a bribe a good thing? But the Bible says a bribe works like a charm for the one who offers it. In whatever he does, he succeeds. What is happening here? The writer is simply stating what generally occurs without making any comment. Those who use bribery often meet with success in this life. That's what he's saying. He is giving a description. He's not giving a prescription. He's not saying go out and bribe people. He's saying I am describing to you what happens. You see how dangerous it can be if we take a description and make a prescription out of it. This writer is not endorsing bribery. He's not a Proving by bribery. He's giving a description. You don't go away. You see why I said it is dangerous to build that doctrine around that description and not a prescription. Now, let us just imagine that it is convocation time. Holy convocation. And of all the thousands in attendance at the congregation, there is the blind man, the once blind man from Jericho, 
the once blind man from Bethsaida and the once blind man from Jerusalem. So just by some, um, you know, just by some chance, the three of them meet up to talk about their conversion experience. So the man who was from Bethsaida says, man, I had a remarkable experience. I couldn't see and Jesus came along and he heard about my condition and he just spat in my eyes and then he asked me if I could see and I could just glimpse and I told him you know I'm seeing but not very clearly and then he touched me again touch me again Lord he touched me again and then I could clearly see and the brother from Jericho says, hmm, that's not my experience. Um, he didn't spit in my eyes and he didn't have to touch me again. You know, I was blind. What I had to do was shout. I shouted. And people were trying to tell me to keep quiet, but I shouted some more. And he called for me, and he didn't touch me, and he didn't spit on me. And I could see. And then he looked at the one from Bethsaida and said, You sure you can see right? You sure you're not still blind? Because your experience is so different why he didn't spit in my eyes or touch me and then here comes the jerusalem man and said i'm not sure if any of you can see you know because what happened is that he spat in the ground so similar to yours but he didn't spit in my face i don't think it is good to spit in people's face he didn't spit in my face he spat on the ground and made some mud and put it on my eyes and sent me to wash. None of the two of you didn't have to wash. No. I said, but me not think the two of you are save. And if these men were fools like some of us, you see, after that holy convocation, you'd have three new organizations formed. Three new organizations. First, Bethsaida Church of Spitting in the Eye. That would be one. The Shouting Assemblies of Jericho would be the other. The United Congregation of Pool Washed would be the third. Because all three of them would have taken a description and made a prescription out of it and divided themselves and they would not have been able to rejoice that all three of them were blind and now they can see let me ask us a question brethren and try to honest answer me honestly is not that which we have done to the body of Christ? Talk back to me if you can. We cannot rejoice with other people of God because their experience was not like ours. Yet we see from their life that they are even far ahead of us in terms of the quality of their life but because they didn't have our experience they are not saved so we're going to have to start three different organizations because we all weren't saved the same way and we can't rejoice that all of us we're lost and undone. And God in his mercy came for us and delivered us.
Do you understand what I'm saying, brethren? I'm not asking you if you agree with me, you know. I'm asking if you understand. So Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. And this, this quotation is one of the clearest statements in the entire Bible about how a person can be justified before God. Abraham believed God and his belief or his faith rather than his works was the basis upon which he was declared righteous before God. The word believed is a translation of the Greek word pistuo. We said this last time, which means to think to be tree, true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to place confidence in. The word is used in the New Testament to describe saving faith. It denotes more than mere intellectual assent to a fact. Pistio describes an adherence to, a committal to, a reliance upon or a trust in a person or an object. So genuine belief involves not only the consent of the mind, but the act of the heart and the will. Biblical saving faith is not passive assent, but an staking of one's entire life on the claims of God. That's what it is. We spoke about justification last week. We said that justification is an act of God. It is an act of God. It does not Justification is not a process. Justification is not a three-step program. Justification is an act of God. It is a declaration by God. Justification is an act of God. It does not describe the way that God inwardly renews and changes a person. It is rather a legal declaration. One of the things we must know about justification is that it is a legal declaration in which God pardons the sinner of all his or her sins and accepts and accounts the sinner as righteous in his sight. God declares the sinner righteous at the very moment that the sinner believes in or puts his or her trust in Jesus Christ. What is the basis or the grounds of this legal verdict? God justifies the sinner solely on the basis of the obedience and death of his son, Jesus Christ, who was our representative. The perfect obedience of Christ and his full satisfaction for sin are the only grounds upon which God declares the sinner righteous. We are not justified by our own works. We are justified solely on the basis of Christ's work on our behalf. This righteousness is imputed to the sinner. In other words, in justification, God puts the righteousness of his son to the sinner's account. And he puts, he put the transgression of the sinners into Christ's account. Just as my sin was transferred to Christ or laid upon Christ at the cross. So also his righteousness is laid upon me or transferred to me. So if my sins could be imputed to Christ he never sinned but my sins were transferred to him if that can happen then tell me why his righteousness can't be transferred to me the same God who does one does the other 
And we said last week that 2 Corinthians 5.21 speaks of this. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. This is the prescription of scripture. This is not the description. This is the prescription. This is what the scripture says. By what means is the sinner justified? Sinners are justified through faith alone when they confess their faith in Christ. Romans 10, 8 to 10 says that. We read that last week. Justification is forensic. Have you ever heard the word forensic? Justification is forensic, which means that it is legal. Your justification, my justification, is a forensic justification. We are declared righteous or just in God's courtroom because Jesus lived an obedient life and paid the penalty for our sins. Because it is the judge of all the earth, God Almighty, who pronounces the verdict of not guilty in respect of the believing sinner, he or she is acquitted forever. No charges can ever be brought against him or her ever again. This is the prescription of scripture. This is what scripture says. Where does it say so, pastor? Romans 8, 33 to 34. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ is the one who died. And more than that, he was raised who is at the right hand of God and who also is interceding for us. Don't tell me about your experience. Tell me about the prescription. Don't give me a description. Your experience may be genuine. But your experience may not be genuine. Brethren, let's not... Let's not be hypocrites in the house of the Lord. We know people who have not had a genuine experience and we have passed them saved. Tell me that you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because that is what you believed in your heart. That is the prescription. I don't care about the description that happened. I don't care about the experience that accompanies that. I'm talking about what it is that saves you at the core level. Are you still following me, brothers and sisters? Because we can't have a question and answer session today. Faith is the only instrument of justification. 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 Faith adds nothing to what Christ has done for us in justification. Faith merely receives the righteousness of Jesus Christ offered in the gospel. Because justification is holy by faith, apart from any good works of ours, we are simultaneously just and yet sinners. Sinfulness still resides in us, yet we are cleared in God's courtroom. Do you understand that, brethren? All of us who are saved. We are saved, but we are still sinners. You know it because you still sin. 
Martin Luther coined the phrase. He said we are justified and yet we are still sinners. We are declared righteous. That's a once for all event. But the making of us as righteous is a lifetime process called sanctification. Although every believer is brought out once and for all from bondage to sin, we are not immediately made perfect. We will not be completely freed from sin until we receive our res resurrection bodies at the last day. This complete and final freedom from sin is referred to as glorification. Brethren, Jesus Christ when he saved you, he already knew that after he saved you, you would still commit sin. You would still make bad decisions. You would still make bad choices. You would still act presumptuously. He knew that before he saved you. So that is not a challenge to him. We are the ones that have created the problems for ourselves by trying to pass ourselves off to people as if we are perfect. We are the ones who have created the problem. Let me just go a little further before I stop. Would you turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 38 to 39? I'm going to read the New English translation, but again, you can follow it in your Bible. Acts chapter 13, 38 to 39. Paul is preaching in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia, and he makes this declaration. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this one, that's Christ, through this one, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by this one, everyone who does what? Everyone who does what? Believes is justified from what? Everything! Everything. When we believe God, he justifies us from everything that the law could not justify us of, which was everything. Brothers and sisters, were you listening carefully? Who did Paul say would be justified? Who did he say would be justified? Everyone who believes everyone who believes what did he say they would be justified from everything everything this is the prescription of scripture it, if when we believe we are already justified from everything what happens to you after God declares you righteous that can vary from person to person? You might have kicked over a bench. But the other person didn't kick over any bench. But it's not the kicking over of the bench that testifies whether you have the power or not. Because if you really had the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't kick over a bench. Because surely the Holy Spirit can see. If you really had the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be running down the aisle and running to me. Because I'm sure the Holy Spirit has eyes. So there should be no collision in church. I'm not supposed to get a black eye in the altar. Talk back to me, brothers and sisters. Ah. 
It is only through this one, Jesus Christ, that sins are forgiven. And it is only by this one, Jesus Christ, that we are justified. Our sins are forgiven because of his substitutionary death on the cross. And we are justified or declared righteous by God because of, because of his life of perfect obedience to the law. Brothers and sisters, another question. Are we resting in the finished work of Calvary and that alone for our justification? Or are we endeavoring to secure God's favor and approval by our own so-called good works? Do we have a strong assurance that we are indeed saved and that it is well with our soul? Are you still afraid when you wake up in the night and don't see your husband or your wife or your parents that the rapture has come and you have been left behind? And you turn on the radio or the TV to see if the news is telling you that millions are missing all over the world. And when you don't hear that news, you feel assured again. How do you think I know about those feelings? Eh? He used to have them. When you are told, when you are in a service and you hear, examine yourself, what do you do? do? Does the whole church flock to the altar to see if they can get the Holy Ghost all over again? Or do they look at how they are living? Are you reaching for another tongue's experience? Brethren, I'm not throwing any stones, you know. I used to say to people as the pastor, come to the altar and get the Holy Ghost all over again. I used to say it. We are trying to correct erroneous doctrine it's difficult to do it's embarrassing to have to do it but somebody has to tell the truth if we are going to be delivered somebody has to be prepared to pay the price you think it's easy for me to stand up here and say all these things when jesus hung on the cross like this and said it is finished he meant it he meant it you don't have to do anything brothers and sisters there is and has only been one plan of salvation i'm closing with this probably just read a couple more scriptures concerning this there is and has always been only one plan of salvation that one plan is believing in jesus christ god has never had more than one way to save people i know what you've been told i know what you've been told every person who has been justified or declared righteous or saved either in the old testament era or in the new testament era has been justified or declared righteous or saved in the same way by placing their faith in jesus christ those who lived in the old testament era were saved by believing or placing their faith in a coming christ those who live in the new testament era are saved by believing or placing their faith in a christ who has come those in the old testament era looked 
forward to the cross. Those in the New Testament era look backward to the cross. But both Old Testament and New Testament believers are saved by the cross. God doesn't have two ways to save people. When the gospel was preached unto Abraham by God himself, God preached the gospel to Abraham. No, God didn't even employ a preacher. Why did God himself preach the gospel to Abraham? Why? I've told you the answer at the start. Because he's the father of us all. God had to preach it to him. He had to get it first hand. When God preached the gospel to Abraham, Abraham believed in a Christ who was to come. We read of this in Galatians 3, 5 to 8, and then verse 16. Galatians 3, chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, and then verse 16. Brother Nathan read it earlier. Does God then give you the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing? the works of the law or by your believing what you heard just as Abraham believed God and it was credit to, credited to him as righteousness Paul says it in, in, in the Bible tells us in Genesis 15 Paul tells us in Romans and here he's telling us again in Galatians in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established So then, understand that those who believe are the sons of Abraham. Who are the sons of Abraham? Those who do what? Believe. Full stop. Those who believe are the sons of Abraham. What does the scripture say? What said the scripture? And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith proclaim what to Abraham? What, what, what was proclaimed to Abraham? The gospel, euangelizo, the Greek, euangelizo, the same word that is used for the gospel that Paul preached, that the gospel that John preached, the gospel that the apostles preached, you angelizo, that's the same gospel, same word. You angelizo was preached to Abraham by God himself ahead of time saying all the nations will be blessed in you. Just want to let you know that Abraham knew about Christ. Verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his descendant. Scripture does not say unto his descendants, referring to many, but unto your descendant, referring to one. Who is who? Christ! Don't tell me that Abraham didn't know about Christ. Let's push it further. The gospel was preached to Abraham and he believed in Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah and Savior. Abraham was justified or declared righteous or saved as a result of his belief or faith. I believe that our Lord Jesus' statement to the Jews recorded in John 8:56, confirms what we have just said. What does Jesus say to the Jews in John 8, 56? Your father Abraham was overjoyed to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. You tell me Abraham didn't know about Christ? Are we crazy? He knew about Christ. The Lord Jesus affirms here that he was the one to whom Abraham looked forward. Abraham's faith rested in the coming Christ. As I close now, brothers and sisters, someone has observed 
that like Paul who wrote this epistle to Rome, Abraham was sovereignly and directly chosen by God. Neither Abraham nor Paul was searching for God when they were divinely called and commissioned. Abraham had probably never heard of the true God, whereas Paul knew a great deal about him. Abraham was seemingly content with his idolatrous paganism, and Paul was content with his traditional but false Judaism. When God called Abraham, he gave no reason for selecting that pagan from the millions of others in the world. Nowhere in scripture is the reason given. Nowhere in scripture is the reason given for all of you that feel that God owes you an explanation. God chose Abraham because that was his divine will. And his divine will needs no justification or explanation. Would you stand please? How were you saved, my brother? How were you saved, my sister? We still haven't dealt with the rough part of it. Which we, Lord willing, will probably try to touch on next week. Where Paul says, he speaks about works. And we're going to see that the word works really speaks of a toil. It speaks about expending effort. <laughs> Paul says, if that is how you were saved, you weren't saved. <laughs> Nobody has to sweat to be saved. Nobody needs to have hand towels to come out for them to be saved. Nobody has to have their belly rubbed. Nobody has to be pushed back. Nobody has to be spun. What is the cloth that is used? Collapsed cloth. Uh-huh. That's our gimmicks so that we can look impressive. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your pure word. What does the scripture say? What does God say? Lord, we thank you for helping us. We thank you for slowly but surely rolling away the mists. We shall know each other better when the mists have rolled away. We're not talking about heaven, we're talking about right now. We are knowing your word in a better way because you are rolling away the mists. We thank you for that. Lord, if there is anybody here whose salvation differs from that of the prototype Abraham I pray that you would extend your mercy and your grace to such a person now I pray that you would help all of us Lord 
we have criticized others for too long we have spoken reproachfully about others for too long we have fooled ourselves for too long we have been ignorant in our arrogance and arrogant in our ignorance would you bring us to a place of repentance and forgive us Lord forgive me for I was expounding that which was not right and so may have caused many to stumble continue Lord to lead us in the way everlasting strip us of our biases our prejudices our triumphalism our belief that we are the ones and there is no one else save somebody Lord truly save somebody help Help us to believe the gospel. Help us to believe in Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.